for the next session. Again, diabetes. We have a very interesting presentation in this session, mainly related to diabetes and liver, but it will start by a very eminent professor and a very interesting presentation. I am very happy to share this session with my colleagues, Professor Shem Amdouh Gabba and Professor Mona Abstor. Please, Professor Mona, to introduce. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to uh, present to you Professor Robert Zimmerman. He is the Vice Chairman. Uh, endocrinology Cleveland Clinic and Director of Diabetes Center in the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism. And he is the Vice President of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists in, in Ohio and is the Chairman of the Meeting Steering Committee. Uh, he's going to talk to us about a very uh, important topic, namely uh, use of non-insulin therapies in type 1 diabetes. Professor Simon. And again, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Dr. Samir and Dr. Abbasi. Um, uh, this has been a really wonderful conference. Uh, I would like to, this afternoon to be talking about a, a topic of utilizing non-insulin agents added to insulin type 1 diabetes. Much of what I'll be talking about has not been approved um, for management of patients, and I'll be going over a number of different agents and what the data is, some of which shows not, no benefit, but I, I would, and some of it does show um, some interesting effects. So, insulin therapy is associated with weight gain, and risks of hypoglycemia, many patients are not able to achieve glycemic goals with insulin therapy alone. So adding other anti-diabetes therapies to insulin has been considered beneficial for patients with type 1 diabetes if it could mitigate some of the adverse effects of insulin, decrease the required number of injections required for diabetes therapy, or achieve greater glycemic control. This presentation will explore data examining various agents typically used for type 2 diabetes in combination with insulin for treatment of type 1 diabetes. The one exception to that is, is the agent I'm going to be talking about first, which is pramlitide. The pramlitide has been approved to be used in combination with insulin um, to, uh, in patients that have type 1 diabetes. The pramlitide works primarily in the area of postcrema uh, of the brain to, um, to affect the appetite and decrease food intake and result in weight loss. It also has an effect on, on the stomach to cause decrease in gastric emptying, delayed gastric absorption, and a decrease in postprandial glucose excursion. The other effect um, is on the pancreas, where it, it affects the alpha cells um, and decreases glucagon secretion. And by doing that, it decreases glucose production and also decreases postprandial glucose excursions. There have been a number of studies that have looked at the efficacy of, of pramlitide in combination with, with insulin. Uh, and, and, and basically, they're, they're, the first study was a study by White House, which was a 52-week trial, which looked at 60 uh, micrograms of pramlitide four times a day. Uh, and it demonstrated that it could decrease hemoglobin A1C from 8.7 to 8.3 percent, 0.4 percent reduction, with a 2.3 percent um, increase in total daily dose, um, uh, and a body weight decrease of 0.6 percent. The, the placebo um, showed no effect on hemoglobin A1C, um, a 10 percent increase in total daily dose of insulin, and a body weight change plus one kilogram, so it's a 1.5 difference between the two different approaches. A second study by Radcliffe and his colleagues studied three times a day and four times a day utilization of pramatide and demonstrated that actually the four time a day regimen is, is um, more effective in terms of uh, lowering the, the total daily dose of insulin, 
percent versus six percent, but the effect that it had on, on hemoglobin A1C in both of the, of the of these was about a change of 0.3 percent. There was a doubling of the weight loss in the patients that which received um, the four times a day regimen, um, and placebo had an increase in body weight. The final study in this was was by Adelman and his colleagues, which is a 29 week double blind um, trial. Um, it, it showed that there was a substantial decrease in, 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 in uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, but it was about the same in, in the um, treatment group and the control group. But in his study, there was um, a marked decrease in the total daily insulin dose associated with, uh, it was a 12% decrease in insulin dose, um, with, and also um, the largest change in body weight of 1.3 kilograms compared to a gain of weight, 1.2 kilograms in, in, in the placebo. So this agent has been approved to treat patients that have type 1 diabetes um, uh, and uh, is available to help those patients. There are uh, about six studies that have looked at DPP-4 inhibitors in patients that have type 1 diabetes. There's only two that really have um, all of the data that we need to see in order to really assess it. Um, and basically, um, the, the study by, by Kumar was a 52-week study um, that demonstrated that there was a, a reduction of hemoglobin A1C from 9.6 to 7.5, but in the, the insulin-only arm, there was a very similar decrease in hemoglobin A1C. There was some uh, difference in terms of the dosage percent um, in, in, in the change in total daily dose of insulin, 49 versus 25 percent. Um, and there was actually um, more weight, there, there was a slightly less weight gain in the group that got um, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors uh, sinuclectin. The second study by Gargan uh, similarly showed uh, in this country, there was no benefit in terms of decreasing hemoglobin A1C uh, and very modest, and no, no benefit in terms of weight. And so, overall, it's, it's not thought that any of the DPP-4 inhibitor patients that have type 1 diabetes is of much benefit. There have been several studies, this is a meta-analysis of, of six studies looking at the difference in hemoglobin A1C in metformin treated patients with type 1 diabetes versus metformin free type 1 diabetes patients. And you can see that there was a non-significant change in hemoglobin A1C in patients that had metformin added, um, in patients that had type 1 diabetes. But there was a difference um, in terms of um, the amount of insulin and overall about a 6.6 .6 unit decrease in the insulin dose requirement in those patients that were treated with metformin um, uh, in this meta-analysis. Again, not a substantial benefit with metformin added to type 1 diabetes. This is a study looking at the effect of uh, rosiglitazone, uh, thiazolidine on type 1 diabetes over a 32 week period of time that was published in 2005 in Diabetes Care. And this looks at um, the effect that this agent has on um, weight and uh, hemoglobin A1C. Um, the, some, one of the interesting findings in this study was that I, I would have thought that rosiglitazone would have increased weight greater than um, using insulin alone, and actually that there was an increase in weight in the rosiglitazone group, but there was not an increase in weight. Uh, I mean, not, not um, compared to just using insulin, uh, the weight gain was exactly the same. So, so it didn't appear that, that it had an adverse impact on weight in patients that had type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Um, the systolic blood pressure, interestingly, uh, went down about 10 uh, millimeters of mercury. Um, uh, and in the insulin treated group, the systolic blood pressure actually slightly went up or stayed the same 125.8 versus 127.5. The insulin dose uh, in the rosy glutazone group stayed about the same, whereas it went up about 8 units in the placebo group. Um, and the effect on fasting plasma glucose was a decrease of about 20, mill uh, 20 milligrams per deciliter, uh, whereas uh, in, the, in the placebo group, um, we saw a, a change in fasting glucose of about 10 milligrams per 
and the A1C decreased by about 10 uh, in, in the gross oblivious region and by 7, 0.7 in, in the placebo. So this is an agent that one could consider adding if somebody who's got um, uh, mark, you know, insulin resistance. There's there's a number of patients now that, that kind of look like they might have type one with sort of insulin resistance and sort of um, sort of features of both things. And, and this might be an agent that one could consider adding uh, in, in a patient that's having particular problems with insulin resistance in type one. But the, the two agents, have, the two classes of agents, I think, that have received the most interest in terms of adding them to type, to patients that have type 1 diabetes, um, are the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, and the GLP1 agonists. Um, the, the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, uh, affect the blood glucose by inhibiting um, SP, the, the, uh, the uh, the sodium glucose uh, transport to uh, transporter, uh, and so it blocks the reabsorption of glucose from the proximal tubule of the kidney into the bloodstream and increases urinary glucose excretion. And there's uh, four available at the present time canaglucosin, dapagliclozin, empagliclozin, and ertuglucosin. And this is just a summary of, of the dosages um, and, the, and the various uh, GFRs uh, that, that one can use these agents with. Less than one third of adults with type 1 diabetes achieve a glycated hemoglobin level lower than 7%. And most patients with type 1 diabetes are overweight or obese. No oral medication has been approved for use in combination with insulin to lower the glucose level in patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, but recently, actually, uh, there is a new one. We're going to look at the, at the um, data from that study and a couple of other studies um, that has been brought to the FDA for consideration to be approved for use in type 1 diabetes. But before I get into the studies on, um, on that particular agent, um, I, I just want to point out that there, had, there was a uh, paper that was uh, published by Peters and a number of other uh, professors um, in diabetes care in 2015 that discussed an issue that had come up, which was uh, the development of uglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, potential complication of treatment with sodium glucose co-transport to inhibition. And, and in this paper, they, they looked at nine patients that had developed uglycemic, um, uglycemic uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, and, and of these, seven of them had type 1 diabetes and two of them had type 2 diabetes. There was a number of different potential contrib contributors, including um, illness, you know, upper respiratory tract infection, surgery, alcohol, exercise and alcohol, gastrointestinal problems um, uh, were, were the major confounding variables in, with these patients. They, they were all treated with canaglucosin because that was the only agent that was available at the time for, uh, of, the, of this paper. The glucoses were very, were ranged between uh, 96 and 220 um, in, in, in um, these patients. Uh, and the, the pHs were at 6.9. Uh, and they did have large ketones uh, in the urine in all of these patients. But, it was, it's very difficult in these patients to identify that there is a problem because their sugar, sugar control is pretty normal between, between 96 and 224. So what is it about SGLT2 inhibitors that might result in patients having um, uh, uh, DKA? So SGLT2 inhibitors um, increase lipid oxidation and lipolysis and increase glucagon. They increase mobilization of the free fatty acids in triglycerides. They increase ketogenesis and they increase beta hydroxybutyrate. And all of this is worsened by decreasing insulin and decreasing carbohydrate intake. The increase in ketones induces nausea with decreased caloric intake and volume depletion. The blood glucose is mildly high, so further, there's a further decrease in insulin. 
And then there's a rapid development of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. So there are three different studies that have looked at, uh, at these different agents. The first one is a four-week trial with epiglifosin um, as an adjunct to insulin patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and this uh, study showed that there was a, um, an increase in urinary glucose excretion, as you would expect, with the higher doses of empagliflozin as shown in the green. There was also a change in fasting glucose of 2.64 <laughs> millimoles per liter uh, in, in the group with the highest dose of, of empagliflozin. And there was a, a change of about 0.1 uh, units per uh, kilogram in the insulin dose um, associated with this. And a weight decrease um, between 1.4 and 1.7 kilograms over a four week period of time. A second study was looked at the efficacy of dapagliflozin in patients with inadequately controlled type 1 diabetes over 24 weeks. This demonstrated that there was uh, a decrease in hemoglobin A1C of, of about 0.6% associated with, with uh, dapagliflozin. And there was a change in total daily dose of insulin um, in these patients of about 14% uh, at the higher dose. And there was um, a, a decrease in body weight of about 3.5 kilograms in the group that had the higher dose of dapagliflozin. And if we look at the effect of dapagliflozin on change in the proportion of patients achieving the hemoglobin A1C reduction of 0 to 5% or more without severe hypoglycemic events, you can see that there was basically a doubling from about 25 to about 50% of those patients treated with dapagliflozin. And, but the downside was that basically that there was about 3% of, of the patients um, had one or more ketone-related serious adverse events, and 2% had diabetic ketoacidosis leading to study discontinuation. So sodagliflozin is an agent that has not been available, uh, has not been available in the United States, and I don't think it's been available anywhere else. And they, they have um, submitted to the FDA to be approved, and their primary purpose for approval has been in type 1 diabetics. They're, they're, they haven't even been asking for approval type 2 diabetes. And this was a study with 1,400 patients with type 1 diabetes receiving treatment with, um, with any insulin therapy, pump or injections, and they received soda flows of 400 milligrams per day. The primary endpoint was a glycated hemoglobin level lower than 7% at week 24 with no episodes of severe hypoglycemia or diabetic ketoacidosis. And the secondary endpoint included the change from baseline and glycated hemoglobin level, weight, systolic blood pressure, mean daily dose of insulin. And what they found was that there, were about, there was a doubling of the number of patients that achieved the hemoglobin A1C of less than 7%. They found that there was a, a decrease um, uh, in hemoglobin A1C by about 0.4. There was a, a change or a difference in weight between the two different groups of about three kilograms. Uh, and there, there was a decrease in, um, in systolic blood pressure, about 3.5 millimeters of mercury. So all of these are beneficial effect. But there was, again, in the sodium flows of the 3% uh, episodes of diabetic ketoacidosis compared to 0.1 in the placebo there was also an increase in, in volume depletion um, from 0.3% uh, uh, to 1.9%. Um, no difference in urinary tract infection, uh, and, a, and about a three times increased risk of having a genital narcotic infection. So the rate of acidosis related adverse events at week 24 was 8.6% in the soda proposal group. 2.4% in the placebo group. The rate of one or more positively adjudicated episodes of DKA, as I mentioned, was 3% versus 0.6%. And the trial regimen was discontinued due to this in 1.6% in the soda proposal group and 0.1% in the placebo So I just want to say that this drug has been submitted to the FDA and the preliminary 
preliminary vote so far has been eight to eight, whether or not this is going to be approved by the FDA. So that there, that, so there was not total agreement that this should be approved to be used in type 1 diabetes. There's a lot of beneficial effects that you can see, but this increase in, in euglycemic DKA is, I think, the issue that's um, making this a question whether or not they want to approve this agent in patients that have type 1 diabetes. The last group that I'm going to discuss are the GLP-1 um, agonists. These are agents that, that act on the pancreas to increase insulin secretion and decrease glucagon secretion. There are a number of different agents that have been approved as, uh, and are used to treat patients um, with GLP-1 agonists. Um, and I'm going to review uh, one or two trials uh, on the utilization of these agents in patients that have type 1 diabetes. I would say that, that because these agents are longer acting, um, they're, they're more commonly now used um, in patients that have type 1 diabetes in the setting that we would tend to have used pramlutide in the past uh, because they have many of the same effects that pramlutide had, and it's usually either once a day or once a week injection. So in this trial, there were 1,300 uh, adults randomized 3 to 1 to receive once daily subcutaneous injections of loracotide at, at the three different doses or placebo added to insulin. The objective was to investigate the efficacy of loracotide added to treat to target insulin therapy or glycemic control and reduction in total daily insulin dose and weight loss compared to placebo in subjects with established type 1 diabetes. And the secondary objective was to determine the efficacy of the ragtide added insulin in reducing episodes of hypoglycemia. So the, the, the subject started as we would normally start patients with a 0.6 milligrams of the ragtide. Um, and and um, every other week, the dose was increased um, to the target dose. Uh, and for the first dose, they reduced the, the total daily insulin dose by 25%, and subsequent increases in the dose were accompanied by a 10% reduction in, in total daily insulin dose. You can see that the ragtide um, at the highest dose resulted in, in a decrease in hemoglobin A1C from about 8.2 to 7.4 uh, after about 16 weeks, but that 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 difference in hemoglobin A1C by the end of the trial, 52 weeks, was more like 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 um, uh, in, in hemoglobin A1C. You can see that the, the, the ragtide uh, did have an impact on decreasing about 0.1% um, um, uh, uh, in terms of the dose of insulin that was being used. And you can see that it had a beneficial effect on body weight decreasing from about uh, 86 kilograms to 82, so about, a, uh, so about a four kilogram loss. If we looked at the effect on, on um, meeting the target of less than uh, 7%, uh, there was an increase in, in, in the in the aid panel from 12% placebo to 20%, so almost a doubling of the patients that achieved hemoglobin C less than 7. If we look at, at, at uh, getting to target without having hypoglycemia, you can see again there was about a doubling. Um, and then if, if we look at um, uh, that also the decrease in hemoglobin C about 1%, you can see that, that there was also a doubling of that. This is a busy slide, but the, the point of this was Basically, that there was 1% um, uh, or 0.9% um, episodes of DKA in this, with this medication. So, pramlutide modestly decreases hemoglobin A1C weight and insulin dose when added to insulin in patients with type 1 diabetes. And pramlutide has been limited due to the three or four times daily sub Q dosing. The DPP4 inhibitors have no benefit in type 1 diabetes. Metformin has no effect on hemoglobin A1C, but decreases insulin dose by six units in type 1 diabetes. Glitazones decrease insulin dose and blood pressure in type 1 diabetes. Loracotide added to insulin treatment results in a modest dose-dependent reduction in hemoglobin A1C level, which drifted toward baseline late in the later part of the study. There was a reduced total daily insulin requirement, reduced body weight, 
Um, an insulin dose did not increase, higher rate of symptomatic hypoglycemia, more episodes of hyperglycemia with ketosis compared with insulin treatment alone. And if we can look at both the GLP-1 agonist, which was 0.96% and SGLT-2 inhibitors, 3% can increase the risk of DKA in patients with type 1, but you see it much less with the GLP-1 agonist. This may be due to the decreased insulin requirements um, that patients have when utilizing these agents. It is likely that greater uh, use of, uh, in, in SGLT2 patients is due to an, an increase in glucagon. So, and that SGLT2 inhibitors can cause euglycemic DKA, making early detection of DKA more difficult. Both GLP1 agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors can cause weight reduction in patients with type 1 diabetes. This may be the most important benefit of these agents, as insulin therapy can cause weight gain in many patients, and these agents help achieve weight loss without compromising control. Both GLP-1 and SGLT-2 inhibitors can improve control of type 1 diabetes by 0.3 to 0.5% and reduce insulin dosing. Severe hypoglycemia is reduced with SGLT-2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. Symptomatic hypoglycemia appears to be increased with GLP-1 agonists. Utilization of these agents in type 1 has not been approved by the FDA, but they, they may be considered to select patients if other treatment strategies for weight management are unsuccessful. So, thank you very much.